a vision is the thing you're trying to build. And if teachers don't understand what that is and how they're trying to build it, I don't know how you move a system or how you move an organization to be doing the things that they need to. We've made it purposeful here that it's shared what we're trying to do and it is super clear what we're trying to do. We have a strategic plan, we have a mission and a vision. A large majority of the teachers and most of the secretaries and some of the educational assistants and the custodial staff, they can tell you what it is. They know what we're working on. Aloha and welcome to the Unruler podcast, where we interview, rather we have awesome conversations with educators, students, and leaders that are trying to innovate, but also trying to make education rooted in joy and humanity. I have the honor and privilege of getting to talk with and conversate and commune with an educational hero of mine, Deidre Raymer. Um, She's currently the assistant superintendent and soon to be superintendent in South Milwaukee. Um, I'm just, Deidre, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, Erin. I've appreciated the conversations we've already had about how to humanize the work of education and um, be able to really focus on bringing joy to every single student that we serve and inspire that sense of curiosity. Well said. I mean, I think my first kind of prompt for you, pardon me, I'm just like reflecting on how awesome this moment is to get to talk to you and share that with the world, um, is what's your philosophy as an educator? What's your philosophy of education? Um, Yeah, I mean, I think about this one a lot, right? Because I get asked that question. And especially as you're transitioning from a place that's had a solid strategic plan and a clear vision for a while into a place that um, is looking for that a little bit, right? And that's the transition I'm making now. So people keep asking me, like, what's your vision? And I was like, oh, we co-create a vision as a team, as the leaders, as the teachers, as the students that we get to serve in this new place. Um, And that's been a big part of my philosophical approach, right? I know we're getting it right when kids can tell me that they feel inspired and curious at school. Right. When kids can understand that they're connecting to pieces of content, but in a way that matters to them. Right. So my philosophy is how do we create the circumstances for every single student, no matter where they're coming to us from, no matter what else they have going on in their life, where school is the place where they feel curious and they feel inspired to figure the rest of the world out. Right. And when we get that right and you see that in students that come back and work for us or you see that in students who by statistics wouldn't have had a shot in the world who are now going off to college or joining the military or starting a business or doing all of those things, you know that we're getting it right. But that has to be the philosophical approach for a whole organization and then the opportunities to model everything you want to be for a classroom to look like. Every time I'm meeting with a principal, every time I'm meeting with teachers, every time we're meeting as a as a team, like how do we model that that sense of inspiration and curiosity and that holding every kid to the highest of expectation because kids can do it. It's just a matter of figuring out what the scaffolds are that allow them to get there. What I mean, as a leader, how does that fit into your philosophy, but also how you model to the rest of your community. Um, Yeah, that was actually kind of a growth area for me as I went into this role, um, unexpectedly, really. I was asked to take on the role that I've been in for the last seven years. And at first I was like, oh, no, thank you. That does not sound like a job I would want at all. Um, And I love my job now more than anything. So that obviously changed. But a lot of it was this idea of like, what does that mean I do? Because I'm so focused on kids. So what does it mean? I was the director of leadership and learning for a long time and now the assistant superintendent in West Dallas, West Milwaukee. And like, what does that mean I actually do? Right. What do I oversee? What do I do? And how do we use that role to really get the whole system 
to be approaching our, our what we want for kids from the same place. And so the first couple of years when I ran what's called our leadership meeting, so that's principals, instructional coaches, deans of students, assistant principals, that whole gamut district office staff, it was a whole lot of like us talking at them around what you know, classrooms could look like or what our philosophical approach is going to be. And what I'm talking about is, you know, we want teachers to not be the sage on the stage and to be facilitating learning and inspiring joy. And I'm thinking, and you come to a meeting with me every month for three hours where I talk at you. Huh. Huh. I'm having like a moment here where I realize like this is not what you do if you really want people to know how to go back and do that. Right. Because from my role, how I'm influencing the day to day experience for students is by getting principals and leaders to understand what the day to day experience could look like, making sure teacher professional development honors what we want for students to make sure all of those pieces are aligned and they're continually following a format or a model that is exactly what you want a classroom to look like. Right? When an adult's learning looks like that, then of course that's what classroom learning is going to look like. Right, So I had sort of this epiphany one year when I was at graduation um, at what was our alternative high school. So we had a system in our, you know, I inherited a system where um, we had this alternative high school. Kids could go there when they were juniors and seniors if they had demonstrated enough significant failure in their freshman and sophomore year at a comprehensive high school. And then we sent them to this alternative high school. And I would go to the graduation at the alternative high school every year and hear these amazing, inspiring speeches of students who had finally figured it out and had a pathway and had people who believed in them. And what they would talk about is what was happening for them in those last two years, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, why do we have a system that you have to fail a bunch of times totally. and feel totally. broken totally, so that we can fix it right. and love the heck out of you totally. and inspire you to go be your next version of yourself? Like, what are we doing? And I sat there thinking every educator needs to hear that girl's speech, right? Because at one point she was a third grader in our system. And at one point she was a sixth grader in our system. And some part of the way our system was structured failed that child enough Right. And both a combination of school, because obviously she had had amazing instructors throughout her whole experience, but a combination of school and life hit a moment for the kids that are, are having this experience where nothing was able to be overcome. Right. So school was felt disconnected for them. Home got really hard and they just checked out and we let them. Right. And, and not for lack of trying, but not having that capacity to get them connected to the thing that really makes them feel inspired. So we really started to talk about what would that look like? And I'm going to talk to more kids. So I went back to that school. You know, I thought about it all summer and I thought this should be like the opening day speaker for all teachers, the kids story. Um, and instead, we had a different opening day speaker that year because we always have a big kind of convocation, places call it, we call it opening day. But instead, I had a group of those students come and be our first learner panel at um, our work back to school workshop for leaders. So these are principals, instructional coaches, again, district office staff all together. And I opened the day with a group of five or six kids from that school to talk about how the system failed them. And then we did this magical thing and we fixed it. And people were fired up because guess what? The principal of the school when that kid was in third grade was in that room and was mad that that's the trajectory that happened to that kid. Some of the people who had been promoted over time were some of these kids' teachers and they were mad. And then we were sitting there talking about how these kids are so articulate and so together and they didn't just magically create those skills. They had those skills all the way through but our system didn't have a structure to tap into 100%. anybody that looked like they 100%. didn't fit in the box. 100%. Right? So we brought a group of kids. The system failed to learn from. Um, and we had George Carroll with us that day. And he took one look and he said, I'm sorry, wait, what? Did you just open the day with a group of kids that your system failed to teach you how to do it better? And I said, yeah. And he's like, well, I'm not sure what why you need me here right now then you got what you needed like go make a plan right and so we kind of bantered back and forth about that and then he spent the morning with us and we spent the rest of the day trying to figure out what did those kids tell us we did really well and what did those kids tell us we better work on because we don't want that to happen to any other kids on our watch and it was this moment 
where we had been looking for ways to get leaders inspired to realize that school needs to look a little different. But you know what a really good way to do that was, was to make them mad. And they were fired up that we have real people that have this experience on our watch. And of course, we were successful with hundreds of thousands of kids. It's not that we had a bad system, but we had a system that didn't fit the mold for everyone. Um, and so how do we ensure that every student on our watch has a different experience? And so that sort of launched a bunch of how we started shifting those meetings, right? Because you know who they don't need to hear from all the time is me talking to them about what they should or shouldn't do. What they needed to hear from were panels of kids. So we've had parents of students with disabilities tell us what it feels like when that phone call rings from school, right? And yet again, their kid has had a bad day. And what does that feel like, right? And we had teams of students who are in a project-based learning community that are just absolutely killing it come and talk about what school is for them. And they said, get ready, we're coming to the high school. So we're going to need it to look a little different because we're not going back to a desk in a row. Right. And so we had kids who were able to share that experience in such a powerful way. Um, we had students, um, we had some black males tell us what it felt like to be a black male in our high schools that launched writing a black studies course that launched having black student unions at our high schools to make sure that we had places where those students felt like there was something focused specifically on them. And they're really inclusive of all students, of course. And um, we had some students who are emerging as multilingual talk to us about their experience in schools. And there's a million powerful stories that come out of that, right? Every single time these learner panels, they tell us something we're doing really well. And then we pause and celebrate that because we don't do enough of that in the world, right? We spend so much time talking about what's wrong and we don't spend a lot of time talking about what we're doing well, right? So then we make note of the things these kids told us we're doing really well. And then they give us something to work on and we go work on it. And we go try to figure out what it is we can do from a systems perspective, from the school level, from a district level, to make sure that we keep doing the things that kids are telling us we're doing really well. And we work on the things that kids are giving us feedback on that isn't exactly going the way it could for all kids. Um, and that is super powerful. Now that became, we start with a learner panel and then we get in small groups. We do a lot of protocol work, which is part of getting and giving feedback, part of making sure that we're actually documenting our progress over time. And then we do a ton of reflective work. So we put an equity non-negotiable up on the board because we've adopted equity non-negotiables as our belief statements. And you find a partner and you talk about as the principal of the school, a time that you lived that one. And then you share the time you missed it because we're humans and that happens and what you're going to do differently next time. And those moments of encouraging them to have more reflective practice, and then encouraging getting and giving feedback from students and from each other to collaboratively problem solve has drastically shifted the way these meetings run. The, you know, I, there was at one point, we used to be kind of a top-down organization. So boy, these meetings would be over and it was like the bell went off at middle school lunch, right? And people are already at the door ready to go on to the next thing. Now I'm like, okay, guys, you can keep talking, but I actually have to go do something else. The meetings don't end, right? They don't end and they stay there. And then we've also been able to hear from kids at particular schools to say, okay, time out. Hey, principal and team from that school, tell us what you're doing at that school that created the circumstances where a student who is emerging as multilingual said, when I said, how do your parents feel about our schools? She told the story about my mama loves these schools because I know I'm supported at these schools and I go home and tell her about that every day. Boy, that's the experience that you want a family that is newer to our country to feel when their kids are at school. And she was an elementary kid, right? Who could very clearly articulate exactly what she thought about that. Well, you answered about six of my next questions, but I, I think like it's the beauty of talking to you. Um, I mean, you're an amplifier and you're a conduit, right? It seems like that's why you're really, really good at your job is that you amplify the voice of others. You create systems and storytelling structures that allow them to authentically showcase and share the peaks and valleys of their learning experiences. And you create transparency, right? And I think like education and business are filled with buzzwords or books, mm -hmm. right? How many like school leaders made their leadership team read radical transparency or I don't know, whatever 
you know, um, it was the University of Pennsylvania um, business person whose name is escaping me, right? Like the, all of the people that have large kind of Twitter followings. Um, but so much of this is common sense. Allow right. human beings to commune with other human beings. We've been doing it around fires since the dawn of time, right? Allow people to feel seen. And most importantly, allow learners and teachers to feel a sense of belonging. That's yeah. what you've created. And it's fascinating to look at your experience and how it starts in special education. And my father, that's what he got his dissertation from University of Massachusetts. His whole work was about inclusion and bringing communities together and not segregating out our learners in different levels. How has starting as a special education teacher um, really been at the core of your leadership strategies, but also in the communities that you create? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the world of special ed, right, what I was trained to do in the world of special ed was find brilliance in kids. Ultimately, that's what I was trained to do, right? These are kids that don't look like everybody else, and they're not wired like everybody else. And my job was to help them figure out their pathway um, in a way that didn't necessarily look the same as everybody else's pathway, right? So that became my job. And I started my first teaching job was in um, a self-contained EBD setting in, at a school that literally was in the dividing line between two gangs. And so we had lots of security and we had all kinds of different people. And we were the only class in the school held at the end of a hallway. You could not have made us more distant from the rest of this building if you had not put us like in a trailer in the parking lot. Um, and I had like 17 boys in that class and I was super young as a new teacher and a couple of them like could drive themselves to the eighth grade. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, here's the deal. We're going to make this work. And I will never, ever forget. I had a student say to me about the fifth day of school, you do know you signed up to work with the bad kids, right? And I was like, oh, time out, my friend. Nobody's a bad kid. You're not a bad kid. But you're right. You are doing some things right now that are building a reputation for yourself that I'm not sure it's the one you wanted, right? Because here's what somebody told me you were about. Is that what you're about? No. Okay. Well, how about we change the narrative on that? And how about we work towards that? And I think that, and I taught all the subjects, right? So I, they, those friends were with me all eight hours of the day. Um, occasionally, we would try to go to gym together, but primarily that ended up with my friends right back on my plate for a while, for the first half of the year. By the second half of the year, we were out of that space most of the time. And one of the things I realized about the kids I was serving at that time was that background and where they were coming from. They had lovely families who really did love them a ton and were super unskilled at how to raise a teenager and were super unskilled at how to navigate the system so they didn't have means and they didn't have things at home. And to realize that I was not too far from the city of Chicago and not a single one of those kids had ever been in the city. And I was like, oh, right. Well, we eat lunch together. So we've already mastered um, table skills because I am not eating with you every day if this is how we're going to sit in communion at this table, right? So we worked on that for a long time. And then I was like, let's take our show on the road. And we went everywhere, right? People were like, you are not going to take those kids in a van by yourself into the city. I was like, I sure am. And I'm going to take them to Navy Pier and I'm going to put them on the Ferris wheel and let's see what happens. You know what happened? A lot of joy. It expanded the experience for these kids and it helped them to realize that somebody really does believe in them. And you know what we discovered in that class? Two of those kids should have been in GCT. What we discovered in that class is one of those kids had a pretty significant mental illness that needed some actual treatment that I was not going to be able to provide in the classroom. What we discovered in that class is two kids who had reading disabilities that nobody had kind of figured out before. And so when we dove into it, it really was about the life story that they bring to school and about the high expectation that we had set. Um, and over time, I had a couple of those experiences. I taught three-year-olds on the beach for a while. I moved to Hawaii for a while and taught um, three and four-year-olds in an inclusionary setting there. And I learned a ton around foundations. Um, that is where I met my first student with autism. And we didn't really know what autism was at that time. Like we didn't have, I couldn't just Google things. So I'm literally at the library, like trying to read up on this autism thing that I didn't really understand. And at the end of the day, it really was about trying to figure out who this human was and then what parts of who she is can we bring into the classroom to highlight? And that's really what it became. And so that sort of drove my experience. And then I taught 
some regular classes over time. And I co-taught with these super amazing instructors and then um, moved to West Allis and again, taught in special education. And I taught lots of kids who were really struggling to read. Um, and my answer to them a lot of times, and these are kids with pretty significant learning disabilities, was, I am sorry, somebody let you get to the sixth grade without being able to read. But buckle up. It's going to be hard for you to learn how to read. And yet it's an expectation that you learn how to read. So we're going to get through this no matter which one of us it's going to kill. Right. And so we just kept at it until we were better readers because it's such a life skill. And you can't just say I'm not good at that. Right. And it just taught me a ton around that idea of holding kids to high expectations. Right. I'd have to text parents sometimes and be like, oh, um, I was the mean teacher today. So just, you know, when he gets home, Mrs. Raymer gave him a lecture today about his participation in class. And I wasn't super kind about it because I think he deserves better. And therefore, right. And the dads would say, thank you for being you. We're good. I'm like, OK, just as a heads up. You're going to file, a, you're going to get a complaint filed about me at home tonight. Um, but it wasn't because I didn't love those kids, because of course I did. But it was nobody had held them to an expectation before. And guess when I held them to an expectation and I loved the heck out of them and we scaffold the heck out of it? They all met the expectation. Like we figured it out. And so that kind of framed a lot of my thinking around what at the time I didn't realize was really good personalized learning. It was just the way I talked. Um, I didn't realize I was a super good project-based learning teacher until I learned about project-based learning. And I was like, oh, you mean like when we had a science standard and we'd build roller coasters in the classroom and then we'd reflect and analyze whether or not ours worked based on the science? Oh, okay. So I guess I was also a decent project-based learning teacher. Um, but that was all framed in how do we bring curiosity and joy into the classroom? So I think that sort of set up the philosophical approach I take when it comes to what a classroom could look like, right? And what a classroom can be for kids and for teachers. Because boy, when you share the cognitive load with kids, it's a lot more fun. Oh, 100%. There's a lot less stress on the staff. Totally. I mean, I think about Ron Berger's An Ethic of Excellence, where he talks about artifacts of excellence, student work that becomes a teaching tool for other learners. From assessment to process to reflection, when they're a part of that channel, the classroom feels like a collective, right? It feels like an endeavor that you're going on. And that was really evident, you know, when I, when I, many, many, many moons ago, when I talked to your students and your teachers and you, it was clear that there was regenerative leadership, that you were co-creating with them, right? And you were building capacity in not just the people in the org chart below you, but with the students that you're working side by side with. Um, how do you do that as a leader? Like, g give me some tips and kind of tricks on how you build capacity so that you can step away, either when you move from assistant superintendent to superintendent, which you're about to do, um, or when you need other people to take on this piece so you can move on to something else. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that, you know, of course, when you're leaving a place that you've been for a long time, I've been in West House for a long time, and I'm really proud of the foundation we set and excited to see what happens with it next and moving to a new district. What you want is to know that the work that really mattered stays moving forward and the work that somebody else says, oh, I wonder why they were doing that. And if we don't have a good answer, maybe that's something that'll change about the work. But a teacher sent me and, you know, you get lovely you know, you should leave a place and go back to it regularly, I think, because as you're leaving, everybody says all the things about you that, you know, you always wanted to hear or whatever, or <laughs> those proud moments where people are like, you know, I maybe you don't even realize you did this for me or you supported me in this way. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize that that was as big of a deal for you as it, as it was. Um, but one teacher sent me an email saying, thank you so much for your time and thank you for all the ways that you've inspired us. And I just want you to know you've trained us well and we've got this and we'll carry forward without you. And I'll tear up right now talking about that one because that's it, right? That's it. The thing I would say about that is you work in a lot of organizations. And I ask this question when I do professional development all the time, like who knows the mission and the vision of their organization? And three people in any room of up to 100 will raise their hands. And I'll say, who knows the mission and the vision of their organization who was not on the committee who wrote it? And those three hands go right back down, right? 
if that's your mission and that's your vision, and therefore that's driving the work you're doing, people should know what it is. And they should be right? living it and showing they should be living it. it. They should get those opportunities to realize they're a part of vision is the thing you're trying to build. And if teachers don't understand what that is and how they're trying to build it, I don't know how you move a system or how you move an organization to be doing the things that they need to. So one thing I would say to people right out of the gate is frequently in a role like mine, right? Like an assistant superintendent of a, you know, medium-sized district, we have about 7,400 kids. Sometimes it's like, I know what I'm trying to do and I tell other people what we're trying to do. We've made it purposeful here that it's shared what we're trying to do and it is super clear what we're trying to do. We have a strategic plan, we have a mission and a vision. A large majority of the teachers and most of the secretaries and some of the educational assistants and the custodial staff, they can tell you what it is. They know what we're working on or they know some of the words of it, even if they don't know the whole thing, because of course you write them with that flowery language that goes with them, right? They know that. And the reason they know it is we start every meeting with a copy of our strategic plan. And we say, here's the thing in the plan we're talking about today. And we're not going to introduce something that's not a part of the plan. But if we need something added to the plan, we're going to open the plan back up and as a collective committee, decide if that needs to go in the plan. Um, and we were really good at that for a long time. And then COVID was COVID, right? And you forgot everything you once thought you knew about these jobs. Um, and now this last year, we've been like, oh, you know what we need to go back to doing? Reminding people of that. So we make it clear to them that we have a strategic plan that drives school improvement plans that then drives the teacher's annual goals that they're required to write as educator effectiveness, although they write those themselves and they choose what area they want to work on. And then it drives their professional practice goal. And that's all aligned to the teacher professional development we offer. So if this is the thing I'm working on, there's going to be professional development aligned to the thing you've agreed to work on. That's a part of the whole organization meeting its goals. So those are like, really important tips is make sure everybody knows what you're trying to do and why, right? What is the reason you're doing what you're doing, right? And if people have questions about that, be willing to drive over to their school and sit next to them and say, hey, what don't you, you know, what's not clear for you? Because it's not clear for you, it's probably not clear for other people. And I'd like some feedback on that, right? So next time I have a meeting, I can make sure it's clear, right? And get a lot of feedback from people and then use that feedback to make sure that you've articulated a common understood vision of what you're trying to do. I mean, that clarity of purpose and people feeling like they're part of, I don't know, a bigger piece than just their class is a core part of what's been successful, I think, in West Dallas for you all. Um, it's interesting to think about deeper learning and project-based learning. Um, and I've seen it be so successful in small pockets, right? I think about one stone, a really cool school. I think about high tech high, a larger pocket. I think about some innovative lab schools that you see in cities across the US or a new charter school like Da Vinci that's building that space out. Um, but when I was at the DLAC conference and I was listening to you talk about your success in deeper learning and project-based learning, in a district that wasn't um, flush with cash, that didn't mm -hmm. have privilege, that had socioeconomic diversity. I was really moved because you were taking something that I felt like is what school always should have been, right? Deeper learning is not this like innovative, like brand yeah. new thing. It's what learning is, it's what learning was for my grandfather, right? right. Like as a tool and die manufacturer, he, he learned through what we say in Hawaii, makahana ka'ike, like by doing one learns. He learned and took what he was passionate about and put it in. Somewhere in the 1800s, that got destroyed, right? In our shift towards creating a workforce and was never recovered. And so we don't need to show a Ted Dintersmith movie or Ken Robinson <laughs> TED Talk. But like, I think what's been really powerful is how deeper learning was a, le was a kind of a lever in mm -hmm. getting your student body more engaged and more passionate about education. How do we do deeper learning in places that don't have all the resources that we normally see? 
Yeah, and you're absolutely right about that, right? So we are large and urban and public schools. We're a public school system. And so we're funded the way we're funded. We don't have endowments and grant money and all of those things to just make it up as we go. Um, so a lot of that for us really was um, some super smart work from the superintendent I've worked with for the last several years, Dr. Marty Lexman. When he came into our organization, we were in the middle of a financial mess. We had a mass exodus of teachers. And we also had, though, this foundation of some personalized learning work that was super successful, but yet the the theory on what to do with that was to create a packet and replicate and create a packet and replicate. Well, we all know I'm not going to a project-based learning school and coming home tomorrow and being like, oh, I think I can just make a project-based learning school. Like, what would that look like? And we also know that, you know, right now we have 18 schools and they, they serve different kids and they serve different staff. And so how do you figure out how to frame something for them that we are going to hold in common and make the space for the school to make their pathway to get there? I, I um, love that. I absolutely love that. Right. Because I, I have a really varied group of kids that we work with skill set wise, back economic background, cultural backgrounds, kids in special ed, kids in, you know, that are all kinds of things. Right. So how do you say, all right, this is what we're holding in common. And then at each school site, that's how you're going to figure out the pathway to get there. What most of our staff have landed on is project-based learning, right? It has a structure. It's a known entity, right? So what most of our, our buildings have landed on is project-based learning as their pathway to get there. But we have some schools that are UDL schools because that was their pathway to get there. And it's that's the instructional format. And I, in my role, I don't get the opportunity to work side by side with every one of our teachers to know their background and skill set to know what brings them joy and passion, and to know the needs of the kids that they're serving every day. So there had to be a clear delineation between what are things that we're just going to decide as a district, and what are things that are going to get decided at the school site, and then what are things that classroom teachers should be choosing on their own. So for us, it meant a structure of doing that was a lot of going to see what's out there. Who's doing this work? We landed on the deeper learning competencies. They've been around forever. We did not make those up because we started to look at from an equity lens, what districts around the nation, what schools around the nation are actually producing outcomes that mirror the ones we want. Let's just go find out what those people are doing, right? Why would we reinvent a whole wheel that somebody else has already figured out for us? And so that's what really landed us on the deeper learning competencies is that there are schools across the nation framed in those competencies that are producing outcomes that look different than the ones we were producing. And you just didn't throw them at schools. You didn't say, hey, this is the D school's way of doing design thinking. No. Everyone do it. This is Project Wayfinder, a cool SEL program. Everyone do it right now, right? Like it didn't matter how great the curriculum is. If you don't give your learning community agency or allow them to get create their own roadmap into kind of getting there, you're, you're again shifting them to passive in their right. education. You're not that's shifting them to active. I'm, right, exactly. I'm telling them what to totally. do. I'm not totally. giving them the space to figure it totally. out. And then I'm going to tell them, please create a classroom where yep. kids are engaged in the process. Right. Well, I better model that all the time then, yeah. right? So for us, for professional development, for teachers this year, we went back to a cohort model. Um, because guess the smartest person in the room is the room, right? Those 25 people in a cohort that are from different schools, th they know each other. They'll figure it out with each other. They don't need me standing there talking at them, right? These, so, these are authentic conversations, yes, right? You're creating yes, a culture of authenticity who are, and human connection, totally. Yes. So teachers this year got to choose from six topics that were aligned to our strategic plan but it allowed them to be kind of on a continuum, right? Maybe I'm just starting with this work. And to be frank, I just need to know how to get SEL into the classroom. Totally. Maybe I'm knee deep in this work and I want to learn how to take a digital portfolio to build more reflection and shared cognitive load with kids in my classroom. Maybe I'm way down the road of project-based learning and I'm going to go to a session on creating more community partners because my kids need to be out of school more than they need to be into it to, to really expand on what we've already done. And so 
teachers had a choice of the six. And then if 300 people signed up for one of them, we made groups of 25 to 30 for all 300 people so that they came to it all three times in professional development. So you came to the first session with those 25 people. And then two months, you went back and tried some stuff that you learned in the session. And they were model and show, time to plan and reflect. Model and show, time to plan and reflect for a couple hours. Then you went back to your school for a couple of months and tried some things out. And then you came back to that same group of people. And you talked about what worked and what didn't. What did you try? How did that work? Anybody got any more strategies on this? Hey, this is really working for me, but I don't know how to fit it in with also teaching all the social study standards. Who's got some ideas? And then they spent another day reflecting and talking and learning together with resources we provided or other things as well, like pieces of learning. But keeping that small because you don't want a whole group lesson that goes longer than a certain number of minutes, right? So try to model that cycle. And then they went back to their school sites, tried some more things and came back for a third time and got in a space with each other. And they talked about what works and what doesn't work. This is when I'm finding stress stressful. And principals led that from a varied bunch of schools and asked the questions, what are some things you would need for support to continue this work? And then I got that feedback and we could say, oh, more professional development on that. Sure. Yeah, no problem. We also shifted the way we do our school improvement plans so that they were far more interactive. I mean, we used to have the kind that lots of places have where you filled it out at the start of the year and somebody put it in a binder. And then at the end of the year, you took it out and you wrote a bunch of stuff on it and then it got filed away. And then, you know, a year later, you did that again. And ours now are intended to be reviewed with the staff every month and they can write on their professional development that they feel they need, resources that they feel they need. Oh, you need a budget to do projects. Great. We've got some money in a grant that we can use to help supplement what you're doing so that, that if that's your barrier, let's solve the barrier if we can. And so that, I think, has been really con that connectedness to all of those pieces is what's made a system that knows if they really want to take this sure on, they're ready. And the second part of that, though, is a pathway to get there. So I have some schools that are in their infancy of this work. And I have some schools that, goodness, mostly what I do is just get out of those people way, right? And yeah. let them do their thing because they are there. They got it. And they iterate and they naturally collaborate with each other. And they don't need that same kind of support totally. anymore. So I, I'm, I'm interested. There's kind of two pillars, two big forces right now that are having society, that's having kind of U.S. and the greater world question schools and education. One is post-COVID-19, right? Like what COVID-19 did, not only for social and emotional learning skills for learners, not only for what we call grit or rigor in schools, but but really having us question the purpose of school. The other is AI and mm -hmm. ChatGPT. And both for me have students and parents and teachers questioning this idea of school no longer being relevant to their learners, right? And if chat GPT can write a beautiful essay or get you into an MBA program, what does that say about our teaching practices that our learners could kind of finesse this by having AI do it, right? Not have themselves truly be represented. And we saw some schools in the pandemic that had the bandwidth shift to project-based learning, shift to passion projects, shift to really rooting education in the superpowers and identities. And then we saw other schools kind of totally go away from that and go back into the easiest piece as well. How, I mean, as we come out of COVID-19 and as we enter the world of artificial intelligence, transforming what teaching looks like and transforming what learning looks like, how do we kind of get back into deeper learning? How do we have that be at the centerpiece of our learning communities? Yeah, I think when it is for us, right, we came back post COVID and the kids were not okay and the staff weren't okay. Um, and, you know, we needed to figure out some new kinds of resources to support the work. We needed to figure out some of those things. Our teachers that consistently have been with kids and are, are doing some of our deeper learning work are certainly we're seeing in, you know, academic outcomes and things like that, right? I'm not a fan of test scores, much like anybody else is a fan of test scores, but they do give you a measure. And it's the measure by which we're judged publicly. 
And lots of our elementary schools are already well back on track post COVID, right? We had a really rough year that first year and many of them are already trending back on track. The high school kids are really, middle school and high school kids, it has been a bigger struggle, right? So we watch what classrooms have better attendance than others and, and how is that happening? And I think for teachers, some of what they were doing during when we did virtual instruction and other things was working and some they knew wasn't, right? So to build in some reflective opportunities to say, okay, there is a different way to do this work. And I also have the honor of teaching at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and I work with pre-service teachers, and it's nothing but pure joy for me. But we spend a lot of time talking about this. You cannot go into a classroom anymore thinking you by yourself can create change for totally. every single student in front of totally. you. This is why people burn out, guys. And at the same time, you also aren't going to get kids engaged and loving class if like that's what it's about, right? If you are about to go be a math teacher and I just gave a lecture on French, would you tune into it? Of course you wouldn't. But that's the language that sometimes we're speaking with kids. And so we have a lot of how do you make it go back to being really relationally driven and purpose driven for kids? So we spend a ton of time talking about goal setting, right? Your one goal might be to get a C and get out of this class. Let's define what that would look like for you and make sure that that happens. Right. Something I have that's tangible goal for you, right? Something that's tangible and doable yes. in that space. Yeah. And the no, time the kids need to be in buildings is to do things like make, build, and create together in a way that they couldn't do from home. Right. That was one of the biggest frustrations for our kids were the missing of the connection because that's been so key in our work. So we had teachers doing like bake offs with kids in the evening, but we don't have kids all the time who have the materials. So she's like, can I mail home all these no bake kits to kids? Yes, we can figure out how to do that so that a bunch of kids can get on a Zoom at six o'clock at night and make dirt cups with their families to unify a class of kids in the midst of all of this. Yes, we can support that. Right. And it was that human connection and that purpose to something else that I feel like people were really missing. And AI is just a ginormous opportunity. What an amazing tool that we just got handled, handed to take some workload off of people. Right. So what if it could write some reports for you that you need to write? Because those are standard. I immediately said to students I had at the university, hey, I think it's the greatest thing ever invented this chat GPT. What I want you to do right now is ask it to write a letter on, write a paper for you on UDL. And at the end of the semester, your then paper on UDL is going to be an analysis of how many of it, how many pieces of it chat GPT got right. I love it. Right? Why? Because don't just assume that because it was created, it's got it done. And now you are going to work on the skill of analysis. And then you're going to have to tell me what you're going to take of that and go back into a classroom. If you weren't the one who wrote the paper, I don't know what you're going to do when you go to apply the skill. I so, mean, we, I yeah. love, we, we built a PBL generator and um, we just, Jack, our director of marketing is obsessed with just what AI and education look like. And so he created, you know, a system where you put in the topic you put in a few of the outcomes and out spits a three month, six month, year long PBL course that you can use as a template mm -hmm. and build out kind of from there. And so it becomes the, it becomes the kind of the foundation that you can build off of in really meaningful ways. Right. And what if we just trained kids to say, all right, it's going to tell you exactly what standards you meet and how you do it. Use it as a roadmap and totally. how it worked. No, 100%. Oh, like, man. What a, what an opportunity, right? Versus you doing all the work and then justifying to me why it did work. Let's see if we can get it right and then judge somebody else for doing it. That's actually yeah. super fun. Our last guest, the Austin Scholar, that's her moniker on Twitter, um, talked about, you know, I asked her, what advice do you have for parents and students? Um, she said the number one thing is to uh, dive into the process of mastering AI. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, I use it for everything. I use it to study for APs. I use it for these pieces. But she said, there's going to be a generation of students that understand it and don't. And that's going to be a huge, you know, bellwether in right. their success afterwards. Um, I think that's I could talk we're all going to have to keep figuring out, right? Totally. Where does it have a place? But yeah. if you start from a place of blocking it in fear, I totally. don't know how you ever get to a place where we get the power it can bring. No, you're right. Because guess what? Everything comes 
just like those students on that panel, they'll tell you something you're doing right and something you need to work on. There's parts of it that are amazing and so useful and parts of it, they're going to be a nightmare. Yeah. But that's the gig. You figure out both. That's a really beautiful way of ending this conversation. Um, and I'm excited for a lot more. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I can't wait to see th this next chapter in your journey kind of to superintendent. Um, I know more of you exist in the world. There isn't, there isn't, a 40 Deidres, but man, we need to clone you so that <laughs> when you're, when you're running education across states and, and across the country, you know, we have more. Um, thank you so much for your time. Of course. Thank you so much, Aaron, for having me on. I appreciate it.